Hello, thank you for joining us as we continue our journey through the Advent season, looking at the reason that Advent has such value and worth from generation to generation leading up to you and I today here in 2020. See, Advent season is a time that uh, we as Christians set aside to reflect on the journey of the Messiah coming to us. It's a celebration, in fact, of, of reflection, meditation, prayer, and praise. You'll notice that radio stations are starting to have Christmas carols played routinely, and year by year, this festivity surfaces. But why? Advent comes from the Latin, and it means the arrival or the coming of something or someone. But not just the arrival of something or someone in general, but something of great value, preeminence, of great worth. For believers, it is where all hope leads. It's where love can be found. It's where joy can be experienced, where peace can be constant. And forgiveness with cleansing from sin makes us pure to once again be in the presence of God who is holy now and forever. See, Advent is a story of, of God staying with us in the best of times and the worst of times. It is a story of God's faithfulness, his love, his power, his mercy, and his grace. It is a story of God becoming man, living, dying to pay for our sins, break the, the power, the hold, the grip, the dominion of sin over our lives, freeing us and bringing us home to himself forever. Advent season is marked by five weeks in which we reflect on uh, different aspects of the story and that those aspects of the story are symbolized with candles, ca candles of a particular color. There are three purple, one pink, one white. The three purple represent hope, love, and joy. The pink represents peace and the white purity all significant beacons to help us zero in on some of the more prominent features of the story of God bringing us home to himself forever. This week is the second week in our Advent series, and we're looking at the purple candle representing love. We're going to be talking about God's love amidst a world that's crying out for love, the need of love to come in and bring healing to us. In the beginning, is where the Bible starts in Genesis chapter 1. And in the beginning, the Bible declares that God created all things. Amidst all that he created, though, humanity alone would be created in his image. Dominion and rule would be given to them as they were to grow in his love, sharing that love with each other and their offspring. As the world, uh, as the world would continue on, as they would mature, as they would do life with each other and with God, they would spread out all over the world that God has created. All of creation would be blessed by the love God shared with those who were created in his image. The setup for this story, for the world and the direction it was going, was perfect. It would be the ultimate experience of God's love poured in and overflowing, touching all that he created. But then sin became a part of the story. See, Advent isn't just celebrating the arrival of the Messiah, but it's also the story of why the Messiah had to come. Sin. See, through Adam and Eve, sin became a part of not just their story, and it wasn't just their problem. It became a part of humanity's story. It became a part of our story. Sin is very much our problem as it was for Adam and Eve. Sin broke the relationship that we had with God, and all his creation is now groaning under this new reality. As children would come and generations onward, the sin problem would only become worse. We cannot fix this. We cannot make this right. The Bible says in Romans uh, 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is something that touches all of us. And as much as we try to put the pieces back together, we can't. We continue to hurt ourselves trying to do this, and we hurt others. Sin has touched all of us, and it, it is the reality that we're disconnected from God. But further in Romans uh, chapter 5, verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death has spread to all men because all have sinned. It's talking about humanity. So it touches all of us. We have inherited this from Adam and Eve. But that's not where the story ends. It could have, but it's not. And that's what makes it so incredible, what makes Advent so precious 
to those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. See, the story would continue with God who never left his creation. He did not abandon us in the place of sin and disconnect. He continued to do life with us, bringing hope into the story. In Genesis 3.15, it says, while he's talking with uh, our, our mother Eve and the devil and the serpent who presented the opportunity, the option of choosing to sin against God, God declares two directions humanity would go. And he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. See, humanity would go in two different directions because of sin. And this, this promise here, this promise was that ultimately the devil, the enemy of God, who brought sin into the narrative would not only be a defeated enemy, but the, those who would refuse to come to God and his invitation for forgiveness would also be swallowed up in that judgment that would come over sin. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And this is one of the more unpleasant sides of the gospel and the Advent season. But again, to truly understand God's love and what it means and to really reinforce its value and worth for not only you watching for myself, but for those who have yet to hear is the fact that sin is a has received judgment from God, and God is going to remove it completely one day. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but for right now, in Genesis 3.15, God foretold that the hope would come through the offspring of Eve, and one day it would bruise the head of our enemy. But why did God stay? See, that's what this candle represents this, this week in this part of the Advent story, the why. The why did God stay? Why did God give us hope? Because he loves us because he loves us. The, the Bible tells the, the, talks about from Adam and Eve, generations onward, from that moment he gave the promise of hope in Genesis 3.15. Now with all the ups and the downs that come with life, we come to a part of the story in the Bible, in the Old Testament, where the nation of Israel is in captivity. See, this is a, an extremely low point in the biblical narrative. It's the, uh, one of the lowest points, if not the lowest point for the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. They pulled their hand out of God's. They chose to continually disobey him. And instead of showing the rest of the world what life with God could be, what it could look like, with his love being poured out over them, they became even more wicked than those who were doing life without God. This was a very destitute place to be. Maybe they were feeling that they were no longer deserving of God's love. Maybe they made one too many mistakes. They felt disqualified, unqualified. Perhaps they just feeling like they deserved to be swallowed up and forgotten. See, it's in this place of despair that our text comes in this morning, our portion, the promise that God gives for you and I today that we find satisfied in Jesus. See, God doesn't leave his people in this place of judgment, in this place of despair. Through the prophet named Isaiah, he would bring his love into this situation. In fact, he wasn't bringing his love into the situation. He was redirecting their eyes to see that his love had never left them. In this place of despair, God sends a prophet named Isaiah to remind them that God's love was not, nor ever could it be earned. His love is theirs because he has declared it over them. See, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, and they would have had this scripture, but just like the Bible is, is a pretty, pretty thick book, and as many times as we read it, sometimes circumstances just cloud our eyes from remembering the things that it says and the value that it can bring to our lives. But God sends a prophet Isaiah, and he says this, that the Lord reproves or disciplines those that he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. See, this, this promise of, of God's love being declared over them, Proverbs was a part of their relationship with God that he was reminding them of. Even discipline from God's hand is motivated by his unchanging love, his unchanging love. Our text this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 5. I say morning, depending on what time you're watching this. Uh, but in Isaiah chapter 40, 
we find the prophet is bringing a message to encourage those that are in captivity in the season of discipline. The journey to Babylon was horrific. It was horrific. Every step away from Jerusalem, every step away from their home was painful. But God wants to bring them something. Listen to this. In Isaiah chapter 40, I'm going to read the first five verses. It says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill will be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. See, in this moment of, of despair and brokenness, where they're feeling like they're disqualified, they're unqualified, the, their homeland is still, you can see the, the, the fumes, the, the warfare, the remnants of the battle and the burning that took place. The discipline that came upon them was double. It was, it was, it seemed to them like a parent who disciplines a child and would lose control. And there's nothing that they could do to protest it because they knew that they deserved this horrific response. They pulled their hand out of God's. They refused his constant invitation to come back to him, to turn their eyes back to him, to put their hand back to his. And they were destroying themselves and they were destroying the representation to the world on what it means to have a relationship with God's love a part, a part of their lives. And in this moment, God brings them comfort with words that are soaked in his love. Words that would bring them healing and direction. And that's what the comfort means. These are words that are drenched, soaked, pulled out, dripping with his love that are meant to bring healing to their wounded hearts, their souls, their bodies and bring direction that his love has not left them. Even though they pulled their hand out of his, his love is still upon them because he has declared that he is going to love them and his love is as unchanging as he himself is. While the discipline was painful and costly, it is a pale shadow compared to the reality of an eternity without God. God sees the greater end of the road that they were on and steps in and intervenes with discipline to reroute them so they don't continue the course and find an even greater sorrow. And that hope that he gave them, that love that he expressed to them, would be a greater illumination of the promise that was right on schedule that would still continue to come in the appointed time. Messiah was coming. The Lord is coming. God's Son will arrive, and His name will be Jesus. As a brilliant light shining for all to see, the invitation to know God's love would radiate out all over the world, from generation to generation, from Isaiah, and here, this, our text here this morning, from the nation of Israel that are in Babylonian captivity, generations later, we would find a man and woman, a young couple, in a manger, and a woman would bring forth a son and call his name Jesus. And I, I just think about this. How prepared do you think this couple felt for the task that they've been invited to participate in? We think about the holiday season, and we think about Christmas, and we think about all the things that we need to do to be prepared the gifts to be purchased, the wrapping, the, the cards to be sent out, the communication to take place. It seems like everything builds upon another, and we have this tendency to always feel like we're behind and, and we're competing against an ever-ticking clock. And when the moment comes, there are times to where we just feel like, man, I should have done this better or I could have done that better. And what I love about the story of the Messiah coming, it comes through a nation that symbolizes just life in general, that there will be times of, of 
yes, I'm ready for this, and times that, wow, I've really messed up. But despite both of those factors being a part of life, God's timing is always on schedule. Jesus came in the appointed time. The moment of being born in the stable was exactly as God wanted it to be. And while Joseph may have felt that, man, I, I'm failing. The Son of God is born in a manger. It was exactly as God wanted it to be. And, and this is what I love about this young couple, that while they may not have felt prepared for Jesus, they trusted God's timing. While they may not have felt prepared for Jesus, they trusted God's timing. While Jesus arrived on time, much preparation still needed to be done. Though, uh, through a man named John, we find that God wanted the arrival of his love found in the person of Jesus to be announced for the world to recognize that something very significant has come. And in Matthew chapter 3, the first three verses, listen to this. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. When he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. It's here we find John the Baptist crying out for all to hear and be prepared that the long-awaited Messiah has arrived. He's here. But the message of John wasn't just to celebrate that Jesus has come. It was also addressing the very real need for why the Messiah had to come. Why did God become man? Why did Jesus have to be born? And see, that's where God's love shines so bright against the reality of sin and the cost that God paid to step in and to remove it from his creation. While we celebrate the arrival of Jesus, we also recognize the need for Jesus to come. See, sin had made a mess of everything. And God alone must deal with sin. God alone is the only one who can deal with sin. In Romans chapter uh, 5, Romans chapter 5, we read verses 6 through 11. For while we were still weak, while we were dead in our trespass, in our sin, while we were unable, the best that we would try to be prepared, to put the pieces together, to make all the arrangements, like Israel, we find ourselves making choices and decisions that affirm that we're broken, and we find ourselves in places of destitution and despair. While we are still weak, at the right time, Christ died for sinners, for the ungodly, for everyone. For humanity. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. And see, what I love about what Paul's saying in this verse is that if Israel wasn't in Babylon, we could understand why God would give them the promise of Jesus. Why God would say, wow, you know what, kids, you are doing so well. Here's, a, here's another gift that's going to help you know my love. But when you're being disciplined, you don't expect presents and gifts. When you're being disciplined, it doesn't make sense that God would step in and bring them comfort and joy and promise that through this discipline, he was going to bring them back home. But he does. And see, you and I in the story, because we're sinners, we're all trapped in a Babylonian captivity. We're all trapped in the captivity of sin. The gospel message is soaked in God's love for you and I. His love that we can know that bondage broken and we can come home. We can come home. Listen to this. The, the, it says, God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For while we were his enemies, we were enemies of God. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ 
through whom we have now received reconciliation. And what, what this is saying is that, yes, it's great that Jesus was born. We praise, we celebrate. Advent is the arrival of the Messiah. But it was the reason the Messiah came that would lead him to the cross. Had Jesus been born and not atoned, not died on the cross, there would not be a gospel message. His death on the cross and his resurrection to life is what brings life to the message, what allows it to be hope, what allows God's love to be ours today. See, Jesus was born to do what you and I could not do to fix the problem of sin and to remove it from our lives. He lived showing us what life with God looks like, filled with his love to overflow. It brings us healing. It brings us deliverance. It brings us comfort. It brings us value, worth, joy. Everything that we read that Jesus did is what life with God is to look like. But then in a moment to where Jesus would do what we could not do. All separated from him, all fled. And the road to the cross was one Jesus alone would take. Hanging on the cross, his blood was shed, his body broken, that he gave willingly because of his love for God and the Father's love for you and I. And Jesus died. But Jesus was without sin. He did not deserve death. He chose to die, taking our death the judgment of sin that is upon us, deservingly, was put upon him, undeservingly. He said, Damien, give me your sin. I'm going to pay the price for it. And he died so that he could bring me life. When he rose from the dead three days later, that life is abundant. It's eternal. And that's what God brought into the world. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever will believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. See, sin made such a mess of everything that only God could remove it. And in this, God shows his love, his love through his son, Jesus. His love is seen against the backdrop of his wrath. God has judged sin and his wrath will pour out and it will wash away sin from his creation. But we need not be washed away with this judgment against sin because God has made a way for us to leave Babylon, to leave the bondage of sin and come home to him in his kingdom forever. And again, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever will believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. See, until that time of judgment comes, Jesus is still God's invitation of love for all. There are still mountains that need to be leveled and valleys that need to be filled. What did Isaiah mean with that? That means that while mountains are high and they can block us from seeing the light of God's love, mountains will come down. Valleys will be filled. Crooked paths will be made straight. Rough terrain will be made smooth because God wants all the world to see the invitation of his love. And so he levels everything out so that all can see and come home to him. Advent season is a celebration of God's love and it's perfect. We don't deserve it, we don't earn it, and there's nothing that we can do to qualify ourselves for it. God declared his love for you and I, demonstrated his love towards you and I, and that love exists as an invitation for all today to know the freedom and deliverance from sin, to leave the pain of Babylon behind, and to walk home with him, to him, for all eternity. This is why generation after generation, since Jesus arrived, we celebrate the Advent season. This is why in 2020, we celebrate the Advent season. And this is why until Jesus returns and that final judgment comes, we continue to celebrate the Advent season because the world still, the world still needs to know the light, the comfort, and the tenderness of God's love. The world still needs Jesus. We all still 
need God's love. This is week two of our Advent series for the candle representing God's love. Father our God, thank you for your love. Jesus, thank you for coming and dying for us. Your entrance into this world fell incredibly short of what you truly deserved. You created all things. You hold all things together. You never left us. You never abandoned us. Even the most horrific moments where we rebel as children, pulling our hand out of yours, running away, hurting ourselves, hurting others, hurting your heart, you continue to love and demonstrate that love with constant invitation through your Spirit, inviting us to turn, to repent, to turn away from the, the direction away from you, to look back to the light and come to you where we can know your love, mercy, grace. Father, you bring us into your home. You call us family. And you pour out your love in us to overflow. Lord, I pray wherever everyone is at who's watching, may they feel the invitation to draw closer to you. I pray that the comfort of the words that are shared from your word, as hard as they can be sometimes, the ideas of wrath and judgment are not pleasant things to talk about, but it is a reminder of the reality of sin and what it cost. Sin broke our relationship with you, and you had to step in and die for us in order to break its hold on us so that we could be with you forever. That What sin has brought over us and your creation is even more horrific, Father, than acknowledging that reality. It is more painful than acknowledging the reality that sin is our problem. But Father, you demonstrated your love to us. In Christ, we have hope. We can know your love. So Father, I pray that all would feel the invitation to draw closer to you, to turn from sin and accept your forgiveness, embrace eternal life, and to continue the course of walking with you. May the season of Advent bring that love into homes, into everywhere you call your children to go. Like Israel was called to show the world we are filled with your spirit to share comfort and tenderness. A gospel message, invitation soaked in your love for hearts that are feeling disqualified, abandoned, deserving of their captivity in Babylon. You call us to declare freedom, and it is only found through Jesus. Bless all who are listening. May your spirit be at work, accomplishing all things that your will desires. We pray this in celebration of the love that is ours through Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining me. This has been week two of the Advent season. Join me next Wednesday as we look at week three, which is joy. Take care. God bless. Until next time.